Okay, so good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this tutorial and like, well, it's a tutorial on, you know, sort of doing Python kind of like, um, you know, not going into, you know, sort of like all that computer science -y type of stuff, but really focusing on, um, uh, you know, sort of how do we use Python specifically for electrical and computer engineering applications? So, um, so as you know, so I'm, my, my name is Alex Wolinski, so I'm a professor in the EC department. I also teach several communication classes, um, one of which is ECE 3311, uh, which is Principles of Communication Systems. Um, and this class, as well as its successor class, which is 4305 Software Defined Radio uh, uh, System and Analysis, both use Python uh, in all the project, uh, project work, right? Um, so what the purpose of this, this tutorial is, is to kind of give uh, a little bit of insight on how to use Python in um, like, you know, for, for whatever application that you need to use it for, but, but to kind of like at least sort of say, okay, this is like, you know, how a variable is defined. This is how, um, you know, um, uh, a list or a matrix or anything like that is defined. So it's gonna be kind of a combination of several things and I'm gonna do the best that I can because you know, it is, it is a really powerful programming language, but I'm going to sort of kick off by, by first of all, maybe I'm not going to do that uh, here. So what I'm going to really just start doing is like the first 15, 10 to 15 minutes is kind of like what the setup should be like, right? So right now, like what I'm doing is I actually have open here um, an instance of Python installed in the Linux operating system. You can actually theoretically install Python anywhere, Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, uh, for purposes of like 3311, because it's a seven week course and people may or may not have been exposed to Python. Um, uh, like what I've done is I actually created something called a virtual disk image and you can run it on whatever native operating system is, right? And uh, so that, image was actually circulated in advance of this uh, tutorial. And I don't want to go into the sort of like, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, run a virtual disk image in whatever operating system you have? Like that, that's a separate question altogether. If you're in 3311, uh, it's best to sync up with the uh, tutor, which is Mitch Jacobs. Um, or if you catch me, sort of like if it's a quick question, you can, you can, I can sync up with you as well or through the course Slack. But really, like once you've get that, um, you know, your operating system up and running. So Linux is kind of like a nice environment to set this all up. The next step is to make sure that your Linux operating system has Python installed as well as some of the supporting sort of modules you'll need for things for communications applications. So first of all, just a heads up. This is being recorded uh, mainly for like, if let's say there was something that I said, but you don't remember, you can always go, boop, 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 you know, go back and find it later on, okay? So first of all, um, what happens is you get this really cool desktop. This is uh, Ubuntu uh, Workstation 20.04.1, okay? Uh, so Ubuntu is kind of like, you know, the sort of like one of the more popular versions of Linux out there. Uh, and it's the workstation version. There's also a server version, but that's a little bit more complicated to set up. Uh, and the applications are very specific for a server. Uh, there's also uh, a variety of other flavors of Linux out there, but we're gonna use Ubuntu, right? So you get into the Ubuntu environment. And the first thing you do is you know, you can go to, like, we're going to do a lot of things in command line, um, although development-wise, uh, later on, we'll play around with something called VS Code, which is Virtual Studio Code. So it's actually a Microsoft software, but it works in the Linux environment. So that's kind of weird, like Microsoft and Linux. I thought that would never happen, but, you know, things do happen. So you go into terminal, and you get this thing. It's really cool. And what happens is like the Linux in, in environment uh, is almost like MS-DOS, but the commands are slightly different, right? 
So that's an, a, that could be almost an entirely different tutorial. So what you do in, in uh, the Linux environment is, first of all, you want to see what sort of version of Python you have, right? So what you do is you just type in Python 3. So there is a Python 2. There is a Python 2. There's a Python 2 and there's a Python 3. And they're actually, even though they're both Python, there's a lot, there's a very significant gap in terms of the functionality, some of the function calls between Python 2 and Python 3. In this course, okay, and this, these applications will be dealing with Python 3 because there's a lot more functionality in Python 3 for supporting things like a lot of the communications applications we do in 3.3.11, for example. So you type it in and you say, okay, what do I have? So right now I have version of Python. I have like 3.8.10. Uh, it is uh, pretty recent, right? Uh, like September 28th. It, it, like, and and uh, what happens is it's like you get this like triple carrot prompt and that's that's now your Python environment, right? So you can you can you can code. You can actually implement all your Python programs, like in in at that prompt, line by line by line. But that's re relatively painful, right? So later on, we'll actually go into uh, you know VS Code because that's kind of a nicer environment, uh, just like any sort of uh, one of these like you know sort of development environments that you use for various programming. Uh, uh, you know, it, things, right? So what we want to do is like, you know, you could go in here and uh, it's like, okay, great. You, you got this. Now, what happens is you may or may not have some of the other programs that uh, you, you'll need for thing, for like, you know, doing stuff here in this, in this tutorial and whatever applications you have. Like, so for instance, like, first of all, we'll exit. So it's exit and then it's closed parentheses. So exit is a function, right? And, and you leave there. So what happens is there, there's a few things that you may want to be mindful of. So one is something called pip, right? P-I-P. And what pip does is it's a, it's a pretty useful program that allows you to install a whole bunch of different modules and libraries uh, because, you know, so there's the Python environment, but then there's all these modules and there just continues to be more and more of these things that are distributed by the community um, that some of them are actually very useful. One community that is like running wild with Python is data science. Python's like really used extensively in data science. Like, so if you go to any of your data science friends, they are going to be Python gurus, like 100%. For us, the three applications that we'll be interested in using are going to be or sorry, modules, it's going to be uh, num NumPy or NumPy, okay? I'll spell it. Okay. Uh, there's, there, there's another one, which is uh, SciPy, and there's Matplotlib, okay? So what are these three? So NumPy really is like a whole bunch of different numerical processing modules and functions and, and other sort of uh, really cool stuff that allow you to manipulate things like matrices, uh, do really cool linear algebra functions. Um, so you know how you have MATLAB? Yeah, this is basically almost all the same sort of functionality you have in like sort of your basic MATLAB, right? Um, yep, go for it. Oh, oh sorry, or maybe. Uh, and then SciPy, SciPy is like really awesome. And, and why so? Well, okay, so SciPy, you can do things like convolution. Okay, that's great. Like, like you could do it yourself, but the, the SciPy version of convolution is actually really, really efficient. But for instance, filter design, if you want to implement a low pass filter, let's say you want to implement a third order Butterworth filter, you could totally do that with SciPy. Like a lot of like what Python is, is that if you can find a module for it, you don't have to program it from scratch. And then matplotlib is essentially like, like, again, I'm not sure if there's any sort of like copyright issues or anything like that, but matplotlib eerily looks similar to how MATLAB plots um, uh, data and stuff. So it's, it's really cool. So if you're familiar with MATLAB to an extent, uh, 
this is going to be very, very much like uh, in the same spirit of things in terms of uh, being able to program with respect to Python. Okay, there are some differences, and that's what I'm going to cover in the first like you know 30 minutes uh, according to like my my calendar here. Okay, so so that that's kind of like you know where where we're at now, and you and you're going to say okay, so let's get started, let's do it. But before I do any any sort of initial questions before I kick off from anyone or everyone's just like saying, okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so let's do it. So um, first of all, I'm gonna delete that, okay? So what ends up happening, let's, let's open up VS Code, right? So I, I actually made it as a favorite. So because I'm really, really bad in terms of remembering names as well as like music lyrics. And so what I do is I like click on VS Code and you can actually implement this. You can actually use any sort of code environment that you want. It doesn't have to be VS Code. Uh, a really super duper popular um, Python development environment. So VS Code is okay, but a really good one that I just haven't had a chance to kind of learn about is something called Spider. Spider is supposed to be like really, really super duper awesome, like including like handling of visuals and stuff like that. I think the way you spell it is like, uh, spider, S-P-Y-D-E-R. So if you're afraid of spiders, don't worry, there's no spiders in it, but spider is supposed to be pretty good as an environment, okay? Uh, here, just because of force of habit and everything, I just, I go along with VS Code, right? So what you do is like in VS Code, right? This is what you start off with. And you look at it and say, okay, big deal. There's a getting started. And it's like, okay, cool beans. Uh, I just close that, right? So what I would like to do is I want it to recognize this, like what my project that I'm about to set up as a Python um, activity, right? So what I do is, first of all, so the thing you want to pay attention to is this little thing at the bottom here. Forget about the problems. Don't worry. No problem, right? No problem. What I want to do is I'm going to go and save. Me, 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 me. Oop. And let's say I go to Shukarinos. Let's go to desktop. Let's go to tutorial and call this thing wig.py. So usually Python, Python um, files like you know that that you run in a Python environment uh, have the uh, sort of designation like the extension is .py, right? And then you do .py, and then you say, did I do save or, oh, mm, okay. Let me cancel, shucks. Yeah, no, I did save. So, or do I have to do save as? Yes, and then wig.py, then save, okay. And what's gonna happen is, is that VS Code is gonna recognize and say, oh, Geez Louise, you're doing Python. So what it's gonna do is it's now gonna do a coloration scheme. I don't know if you can customize the color. So let's say um, you're more receptive to certain colors than others. Like, so for instance, I had one master student uh, who was actually colorblind. Like, I mean, seriously colorblind. Like he can't see green, he can't see red. Uh, so I remember for his master's thesis, when he was producing plots and they were like some really crazy, like, you know, spectral plots, he chose colors that were like orange and black and gray because he can actually see them and such. So that like actually choosing color. So if you have such a, like, if you have a preference for like a like color scheme, I believe you could customize it. I haven't, I'm just choosing the default. But one thing I want to point out is this thing here. Right now, what happens is Python um, because of the .py, VS Code saying, oh, you're doing Python. Uh, we're going to use this, this Python here, Python 3.8.10, 64-bit, uh, and the location. So in the Linux environment, um, just like in Windows, you know, you have program files. In the Linux environment, your executables for your applications and such are stored in places like, like, Forward, uh, forward slash bin forward slash Python three, right? So there's a root directory, which is forward slash. And then 
you know, you have various directories where, you know, you have user files or you have temporary files. Bin tends to be where the executables are, right? So right now it's like saying, okay, you got a Python file. Uh, we're going to be using this in order to run stuff. And so what you do is the following. First of all, and let me make sure I have my like, checklist because there's a bunch of things I want to make sure that, like, so first of all, commenting in Python uh, is that the pound sign, okay? So what you do is you do pound sign and you say, this is Wiglinski's tutorial um, shucks, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, tutorial um, uh, five, right? And so right now it's like everything from that pound sign all the way right from it is, is all gonna be uh, comment. It's not gonna be executed, right? Uh, you can do, uh, if you want, you can put things like, for instance, your name. So A Wiglinski, you can put the date. So whatever today's date is. So we're getting close to Halloween, which is actually pretty awesome because that reminds me I have to do my, like I have to make my daughter's costume. Okay, and now very importantly, um, usually it's, it's like the thing about Python is that when you run it, it's like, okay, Python has everything I need. Let's go, go, go. Not quite. Just like C and C++, what happens with Python is you got to bring the kitchen sink. You got to actually uh, like indicate to Python which modules you want to run as part of your function, as part of your experiments, as part of your code, right? So how so? So you know that NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, it's not automatically loaded into Python. You're gonna to have to call it out explicitly. So the way you do it is you use a function called import. So you would say just so so it's very similar to like C C where you know you have standard input, you have standard output, you have string.h, all those header files. You have something similar here. So you do import. And so suppose you have you want to bring in numpy. You do numpy. Right? Now, um, so as you'll see later on, uh, for convenience. Uh, you're going to be, if you use a function or multiple times a function or many different functions from NumPy, you're going to go crazy because you're going to be typing NumPy a lot. So what some folks do is you can actually replace it with kind of like, a, a, like an abbreviation. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to abbreviate NumPy as NP, right? Suppose I want to bring in SciPy, right? So you do import SciPy, okay? And uh, you, here uh, you can you can you can just for now let's just keep this as is um, because we we won't use it as much. Uh, but perhaps with Matplotlib import Matplotlib that's a that's a biggie Matplotlib. Maybe you want to keep it as PLT for plot, right? And there are a lot of others. There are a lot of others. Um, why is that there? Remove unused import. Okay. Well, we'll get there. Okay. So actually, or whatever, right? right? We could just like, use SciPy. Um, there we go. Let's just do that for now, just for fun. So we got like these three, these three things. So what happens is what this does is it now, when we run this file, when we run this file, what's gonna happen is in, in the Python, in a, in a Python interpreter, what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, oh, gee whiz, don't forget, I need to load up all the modules from NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib before I do any execution of code, okay? So that's really important. So we kick things off with this import. So then the next thing is we need to, um, first of all, understand how does Python work? And when I say it's very similar to MATLAB, I, am, I really do 100% mean that this is, what, this is very similar to MATLAB, right? So MATLAB um, 
you know, like, you know, you often don't declare in MATLAB what data type you have, right? It's just like, huh, X is equal to three. You can totally do that. So let's say we have X is equal to three. Notice here that you don't, you don't terminate the line with a semicolon or anything fancy like that. It's just like X is equal to three, all right? So if I do it that way, and then I do something. So first of all, um, then a, uh, you know it's always good to comment. So let's say first example, right? And I say x is equal to three, and then afterwards I say print x. Okay. What's going to happen is now first of all I want to save it. It's always good practice to save, especially with all these blackouts today. Boop. And then what I do is I run. And what happens is, this is what's nice about this environment is instead of having to go into the command line and call that function, um, what happens is a terminal window opens at the bottom of the VS code and you get exactly, you get the terminal in the environment. It's really nice. Um, so one caveat in all of this, and I think for the purposes of 3311, because it's only seven weeks, we can get away with it. Uh, for more, more acceptable programming practices, everyone should really take a look at creating uh, something called a virtual environment. Okay, uh, like so there's all this talk about virtual environment uh, or v, VNV. And the reason why you want to take a look at that is is what happens is if you do a lot of installation of different packages and your computer goes through a lot of updates and such, what you want is what virtual environment does is it's kind of like a freeze frame of let's say I install this version of NumPy, this version of SciPy, this version of Matplotlib and a bunch of other things and it works. I wanna make sure that like the virtual environment it's like you're almost installing these packages in that in virtual environment and they'll never be touched or messed around by the outside world, like the rest of the operating system. So stuff will happen outside, it doesn't matter, your virtual environment's still preserved, right? Um, the other good thing is let's say you completely mess up your virtual environment and it's like nothing's working, Every, there's like errors spewing out everywhere, blah, 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 blah. A, throw away the virtual environment and start again, right? So well, I'm not trying that here in 3.3.11 because maybe I'm a little bit of a sloppy programmer or, or at least not a diligent one. But at the very, but, but the thing is, because the course is kind of like short term, um, I don't think we'll run into that issue. Normally you see it if it's like over months, like many, like six months, a year, and then you go back to your project and oh, shucks, you know, Python 3.8.11 came out and things begin not working. That's a problem, right? So VNV is kind of nice because it kind of freezes the versions of the type of libraries that you're using. So uh, it doesn't get affected by updates or anything, anything of that nature. Or uh, if you kind of go bridge too far and install packages and you mess up your install, uh, you just throw away the virtual environment and you start from scratch. Uh, because the alternative is you would have to reinstall Linux and it gets very, or, uh, you know, try and clean up Python and that's very, very messy, right? So going back to this, what the print function does is, oh, that's nice about v, uh, uh, VS code, is if you hover over a function, it gives you, it gives you, and it's not magical, it gives you kind of the details of what that function does. Okay, so there's a, a question. I am getting a module not found error for NumPy. Ah, so so that's that's interesting. So let's see. So one. Oh, okay, so several people are mentioning that. So let let's let's uh, uh fast forward. Well, okay, so. Which okay, so maybe to ask the the folks on on the call, which which function are you calling, or is it just happening 
we need to import numpy as np or are you trying to do uh, call a specific function for the, uh, from numpy it's just the import oh okay that is move Okay, that's a good, so one thing, so usually if there's something of that nature, so so one thing to do is, is to try and do something like maybe to try and do a pip install again. So it's, what, what is it saying again? Like uh, uh, it, it's, it's saying. Yeah, it uh, says like module not found error. There's no such module as numpy. <laughs> ah, okay. So let's try something. So, so this is exactly okay. So what you want to do? Let's let's um, close this or not close, just minimize this. So let's say you get into a situation like that. What you want to do is you you may want to try this pip install numpy. So this would actually install NumPy if it's not there, right? Um, th the distribution that I sent out should, should work. The other, oh wait. So the other thing is which, very importantly, so there are two things. So one is pip install NumPy, okay? If, if it's like honest to goodness not there. Part two is when you go here, which Python uh, are you are you using? Are you using forward slash bin forward slash Python three, or because there are two? There that, that's the thing. Like it's kind of silly, but there potentially could be. In this case, this image that's distributed to everyone. There is bin Python three. There's user bin Python three, uh, and then forget about Python two. So bad, bad, bad. Don't. So there are two Python. So first of all. Are you using bin Python 3 or user bin Python 3? Because, because if you because I think when I did the installation, it was done for bin Python 3. Um, I'm not sure if I'm reading this from the correct pathway, but it looks like it's user bin env. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So <laughs> So what you'd want to do is select at the bottom of Virtual Studio, like Visual, sorry, Visual Studio Code, bin Python 3, not user bin Python 3. Thank you. Welcome. Are you getting it now or is it, or, or was it not working? Is it working now with bin Python 3? Um, Let's see. Which menu is that in? So, so if you go to the bottom, bottom left and you click on that like where it says python 3.8.10 uh, then you have a choice of interpreters you want to choose bin python 3. how did you access the menu with the list though oh no so that that's the, you see where my arrow is hovering at the bottom left Like, so you see where my cursor is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So click on that once, bloop, and then click on bin Python 3 in, in the menu. And then- I don't see a thing that says bin Python 3. In, in that list. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Clicking on it's not opening that list. Oh, if you do you want to share just your like your 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 Linux environment to, so so we could take a look or oh sure. Uh, do I have screen sharing permission? Yep, yep. Go go for it. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Oop. Share screen.
Awesome. So, uh, oh, okay. So you you did. Ah, uh, yeah. Actually, actually, Emma, this is this is actually super perfect. So so first of all, so because you 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 did. Ah, uh, oh wait, are you using the older, like last year's environment, or did you did you create this this one? yourself to so what you did is you actually did exactly what i described a few minutes ago about the virtual environment so that's actually really cool that's actually really cool so so what you would want to do um move is first of all like actually click install for for plint but uh, pilot so okay. what Py, Py, what pilot is everybody uh lint is a type of debugging Debugging environment that's used in, in um, uh, you're using pip version blah blah blah. Okay, so first of all, you're going to have to uh, upgrade uh, pip. Okay, so um, what you're going to need to do. So would that be back here? Yep. Yeah, but but here's the thing: you're installing you're installing pip like you're installing numpy not in the virtual environment that this is this is actually really good this is actually really good so so what you would want to do is you would want to go to the virtual environment or better yet get like if you go back into vs code um uh like uh switch switch uh, switch out of the virtual environment so, so let's go back to VS Code and then hover over Python 3.8.5, which is pretty old. That's last year's, right? So they go to all the way to the bottom, bottom left, where the purple thing is. Yep, click it, click that. And now choose, uh, yep, yeah, that's one. Okay, so now, now try and run it. You can also something you have to actually. So you need to get out of the you need to get out of the terminal. There. Oh no, it did do it. Yep, there it is. The only thing that's kind of annoying is it's still the terminal. So so everyone, the way you know that you're in your virtual environment. So check this out. This is actually really good. Thank you, Emma, for this. But like, check it out. Like at the be at the beginning of the prompt. So you see in green the ECE three three eleven at ECE three three eleven hyphen virtual box. Right before it, you see round brackets, ECE three three eleven underscore env. That denotes that you're operating in the virtual environment. So if you want to install, um shucks numpy in the virtual environment this is what you would do so maybe emma if you can go to to yeah to the terminal that's actually perfect what you would want to do is and what is the command for going into the virtual environment um uh, enter. And, uh, there's a silly like see i'm i'm just all about yeah, pip, da, 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 source. So what you want to do is you want to go into that, that directory. So go to source. So first of all, what's the path, what's the path to the virtual environment? So if you could do PWD, PWD, D, D, D as in David. Uh, no, P, P, W, D. So Paul, Wiglinski, David. Yay. Sorry, I'm in AK and they're vacuuming in here. So it's a little ah. bit hard to hear. <laughs> tell, tell Marlene to, to turn off the back. <laughs> I haven't seen her in two years. I have to say hi. So now enter, if you type enter. Okay, and and maybe do an ls just to see where we are. So we would want to go into um, 
where 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 were the virtual environments set up? The, so the ECE three three eleven underscore and I think is it under is it under um, projects like ECE three three eleven underscore projects? Is that correct or is it somewhere else? Uh, should I look at what's in ECE 3311 projects? Yeah, well, I mean, maybe this is a topic for another time, but, but, but no, but this is actually good. Maybe anyone who's interested, we can go through it. But this, like what Emma's doing is like, like going through a virtual environment is really kind of the, you know, sort of the best way to do it. Like right now, the, the error that, 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 that was coming up before was because you can select the interpreter that also, if you have a virtual environment, you would want to run the Python interpreter in the, in the virtual environment because you know that it has not been updated, it's stable, it has not been influenced by the rest of the operating system. But the, but the downside is even if you installed NumPy for the entire operating system, you have not installed NumPy for inside the virtual environment. So the, what you would need to do is you would need to type source, and then you would need to find the path all the way to the virtual environment. And then there should be a folder in there called bin. And inside bin is a, is a function called activate. You would need to run activate in order for your command line to be in the virtual environment. So in fact, like maybe Emma, um, what we could do from the terminal in VS Code, let's install NumPy there, shall we? Oh, so does that mean that if I had NumPy installed in my ECE 3311 projects, it's not installed on the rest of the virtual machine? Uh, if you had NumPy installed for all of the Ubuntu virtual machine, it would not have been installed in the in the virtual environment in the virtual machine. It's, I know it's like virtual environment, here's Ubuntu in your virtual machine, and then here's your operating system of your laptop. Yeah, I know it's like, it's like a, what is it? A, like a turduncan, <laughs> turkey, what is it? Um, a, a duck within a turduncan. So chicken within a duck within a turkey. I don't know, you know, like we don't, we don't eat meat in this family here. So, so yeah. So yeah, so what you're doing right now, that's how you would install pip, if you, uh, sorry, numpy, if you did not have numpy installed on your computer in the first place. So you would run pip, there we go. So now if you were to choose the interpreter, so if you go to, uh, you know, that thing at the bottom left, click on it and now go to the bottom one, the bottom, yeah, that one, that's your virtual environment and that's protected from any updates, any installs on the outside world within your virtual machine. So that way, you know that that Python setup is going to work, right? So if you now run your code using that interpreter, uh, because you also have to do the same thing with SciPy. So if you go, if you do pip, install SciPy. Okay. And it's going to go be a really cool status bar thingy. Yeah, so see VS code is pretty cool. Although I know a lot of people still swear by spider. <laughs> yeah, so at some point, you're going to need to upgrade pip. And then you need to do that the same thing with matplotlib. Yeah, I'm using last year's 3311 disk image, which is probably why it's yelling yeah. at me for having outdated versions of stuff. But, but the thing is, doing it in the virtual environment protects you from all of that. So now, if you run this code, and the short, the quick way of doing it, instead of going to command line run, there's a little triangle top right that, that you can, yeah, looks like the play button. Nope. There you go. The answer is three. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. No, no, very good example. Did everyone see that? Thank you. Thank you. So what we'll do is let's go back to 
um, move. There we go. Remember that really challenging password. <laughs> Wait, there's a, another question. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so now you got you got this this setup, right? Um, so now with data types, there are four data types in Python. Um, there's int for integer, float for floating point. There's string, and there's boolean, right? And so what happens is um, what what happens is you know like if you do something like for instance like oh, you, come on silly there we go if you do something like let's say uh, a is like and have a nice day and then b um, ECE 3311 is great. Uh, what you could do is something like, okay, C can be the combination of A plus B. So this is a type of string concatenation, right? And then if you print this, what you should have, uh, let's, let's do that. <laughs> and I'm gonna put here a second example. And you run it to first save, loop, and then you run it. Ah, and you do need to put a space, otherwise you get weirdness like that. Yeah, perfect. So you get that. Now, um, what ends up happening is, let, let's make this a little bit more interesting. If I do that, you might say, oh, but 3311, uh, that's an integer. Yeah, but with the quotes, it's still a string. It's considered a string. So in fact, if you play, if you do run, it actually will save before it actually runs, right? But suppose now I do the following. Zoop. That's the third example. What happens if instead I do this and ECE, and then what I do and let's say I put something here D, 3311, and I do D, what's gonna happen is Python's gonna scream at me. It's gonna say, so can only concatenate strings, not into string. And that's fine because what happens here is that uh, data type is not, is not working at all, right? So what you got to do here is you're going to have to typecast. So the way you typecast is you, you like, you know, if, if it's an integer issue, you use int, um, uh, float, you use float, uh, boolean, you use b-o-o-l, and for string, it's str. So you can hover over it. That, that's the nice thing about this environment. You can hover over like a command or any other sort of feature of Python, and it's going to give you sort of shorthand. What I found is the documentation online for Python. If you go to, you know, like a python.org, like which one, which one do I normally go to? Yeah, so there's something, there's a website called docs python.org and I'll put that into the chat to everybody. Docs.python.org. That is actually really, really like the thing about it is it gives you an extensive description of here's the function, how it works. Um, here's the definition of every one of the input variables and all the output variables. And then it gives several really nice examples at the end. That, like the thing is, like I have to admit, like it's been a while since I played with Python, like maybe a couple of months, right? And I'm like, oh shucks, I forgot how to do this. I forgot how to do, the, the documentation's really cool. Like it'll, you'll pick it back right up. It's a little frustrating at first, but then you're on a roll because you're using the same thing over and over and over and over again. And there's also a few other places. Like if you're trying to, like if you have like these difficult 
sort of error messages. And you're like, what the heck is that? Obviously Google, everybody types in Google, make sure to use double quotes so you get like an exact hit. But some other places is like Stack Exchange is actually really, really good because you probably are not the first person to have some similar error. So usually I check Stack Exchange to see if anyone's had something similar in terms of that type of um, issue. So going back to typecasting, um, I'm going to typecast D from integer to a string. And if I do that, I'm in business. Okay. So, so what I've got, all right, is I've got now this, this thing where uh, it used to be an integer, but then I made it a string. And then I, I concatenated with other strings, and now I'm all good. Right. So, okay. So there's going to now here's kind of where the weirdness happens. Not, not seriously bad weird. And we're not going to actually use like, unless you really want to use it. There's this thing called lists. Basically, it's the equivalent of your vector or matrix in MATLAB, right? Uh, and it pretty much works like that. Like, so let's say if I want to create, Here's second, here's a third, here's a fourth. Okay, so what happens is a list, okay, uh, the way you, way you define it is you say, okay, uh, let's say I have something called, um, hmm, a list. And then what I do is I use square brackets and I say, one, two, three, four. Okay, cool. And then I do print a list. What happens? I get this, one, two, three, four. It's my list, it's a vector. I can also make two-dimensional lists, right? So I can do, so this, what it requires is sort of double square brackets. So I'm going to have this, and then I'm going to have five, six, seven, eight. Oop. Hey, come on. Yeah, that's it. And if I do that, now what that does is I have a matrix. First row, one, two, three, four. Second row, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. But there's also this weird thing. Uh, this, is, this is one of those quirks in Python that takes a little bit of thinking, and it's called a, a tuple. And you're going to hear this term called immutable and mutable, right? W what does that mean? OK, so mutable means I can modify it. So, so when I make a list, I can actually replace an element in the list. So let's say I don't like the, the number three. I want to replace it with something, right? So uh, so let's let's go back to our original setup here. Okay, uh, so I got that. Okay, cool. Now, um, suppose I want to create B list. Ah, B list. So B list is almost the same as A list. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change um, one of the elements in B list. So let's say, um, we'll just double check change. So, so I'm going to change one of those uh, elements. So remember in Python, indexing starts at zero, not one. All right. So let's say I want to change the third element. So that's going to be zero, one, two. So two, and I want to change it to 99. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do print, and then I'm going to do another print for B list, right? So if I do that, oop, ah, okay. So uh, 
this is, I forgot, see? So right now uh, in, silly me. Okay, 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 it's square brackets. <sighs> silly me. But so, but that's the thing. It's like, it's kind of like really like a refresher. So it's square, run it. And there we go. So what ends up happening is it's almost like MATLAB, but don't forget, you also have, you could also replace, like let, let's say I want to now do round brackets. Actually, this is kind of interesting because I've never tried having a tuple then assigned to another variable, like if it still maintains a tuple. So tuples are almost similar to define as, close that, come on, oop. There we go. Tuples are almost similarly defined as, as lists, except that's round brackets rather than square brackets. But let's say we try and change an element in a tuple. If we do that, error, because tuple cannot be changed. It's immutable, right? So now, we, so we got that. Let's change that back to a list. Why? And lists are great, but the thing is they're not efficient. They're not compact. So that's where NumPy comes in actually very, very handily. So a couple more things until we hit kind of like one of these more important kind of functions is there is something called range, right? So what range does is it literally creates kind of like, so if let's say I do something like this. So let's say C, um, you know, foo, no, no, we could do foo later. So let's say C, Alex, just for fun. I'm running, I'm just creating variable names as, as we go. What happens is if I call this range six, what does it do? So what range six does is it will automatically create a list of zero, one, two, three, four, five. And that's really awesome because imagine you need to create a thousand of those from zero to 999, use the function. And just to test it out, you do print, And if you run it, and here what you have is a range from zero to six. So it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't print at all, but so that's cool. Now, um, a couple of other things. Uh, J, just like it's complex notation in, in all our classes, if you use J here as for a complex number, so let's say I do, um, take the range and then I multiply it by J. I've never tried this before, so let's see how bad this goes. J is not defined. That's not true. So let's let's try another one. J is most definitely defined in Python. If not, you just say square root of so and so, right? Six example. So D, Alex. So if you have J and then you print D, Alex. Geez Louise, it's not? Yeah. Okay, my apologies, folks. I really thought that was. So, so what ends up happening is uh, Python, it might be in another library. Defining J. Complex numbers in Python. B D B D B D B. Oh, okay. So what you have to do is you have to put a number in front of it, or at least that's. So it's not. So otherwise, it thinks it's a variable. So, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See now, color changes. Fingers crossed. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, see, very interesting quirk. So not only can you just leave J by itself, it actually has to be 
a number with j right after, not multiplied, but just by itself. Okay, so, so far so good. Like, you know, so far we're getting through the basics. So any questions up to this point? None, excellent. So, so now um, this is the sort of next thing is for loops, okay? So that's another one that's kind of weird in, in MATLAB, all right? So with MATLAB, no, sorry, not MATLAB, in Python. So in MATLAB, seven example, the way for loops are defined is kind of along these lines. So you have, let's say you want to create an accumulator. So let's say we call this var accum, right? And you start it off with zero. So I initialize this variable. Then I do four. Okay, and then I define some sort of index. And then in MATLAB, you would normally have like four end, and then you would do zero, colon, 10, blah, blah, blah. No. In, in Python, it's end, okay? And then, you know that range thing I was just talking about? Over here. So what you would do is you would say, end and the index is assigned a value at every iteration within this vector of possible values right so here i would say range and i would say let's say range six perfect or better yet let's just go to see alex right from the previous example and then you do a colon. So see Alex, notice here on line 35, I already defined it. So now this is actually really important. So a couple of things. So first of all, in is gonna sort of point at the first value in C Alex, which is gonna be zero. It's gonna, okay, in is equal to zero. And then execute the code within the for loop. Now go to the next iteration. In now goes to the next value in C Alex, which is going to be one, execute, and so on until it reaches the end of C Alex, which is going to be the value of five, execute, and then exit the for loop. Now, very importantly, what's going to happen is notice how when I did a carriage return, I suddenly got indented. So Python's one of those funny computing computer languages where it's sensitive to indentation. So the first time I ever experienced a programming language like that, it was Fortran. Fortran was very sensitive to indentation. A lot of other programming languages are not, but Python is. So as long as whatever follows the for loop is indented, they'll get executed within that for loop. Once you are no longer indented, the for, the for loop says, oh, you're not part of my for loop. I'm not going to execute you. So if let's say here, I do this. So I do the for loop. And I do, let's say, print end. And then I do it again, print end, what you're, you're going to see is the following. Oop. So notice how 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. So what has happened is end is assigned to 0, and then it prints 0. OK, next iteration. End is now assigned a value 1. Execute what's in the for loop. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, that's it. In all of C, Alex, exit for loop. Hey, there's a print statement for end. What is the last value that's stored in the variable end? It's five, print five. Okay. So, for, so the for loop, all, as long as you have this indented, it's all fair game. 
It's all going to be stored. It's all going to be part of that for loop. It's going to be executed iteratively. Once you're no longer indented, it's a signal to the for loop. And you can have multiple lines. So let's say you have end. Um, let's say you have another print statement. Print, let's say end plus, um, uh, shucks, I don't know. Um, yeah, like in plus one or something funny like that, or 10. What you're going to get, yeah, is you're going to get um, 0, 10, 1, 11, 2, 12, blah, 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 blah. and then when you hit the end of your for loop and is no longer indented, 5, right? Okay. So, so this is going to be really important whenever you do any sort of like sequential processing. It's going to be really, really important. So what happens also like with, with in addition to for loops, there's also function calls. So functions are really important because if let's say, so for, let's say with a for loop, suppose I want to execute something really cool, right? So let's say I want to execute like, you know, something, but I want it kind of compartmentalized. What I would do is I would go all the way to the top here. And I would use the def. When I use def, def means, hey, I'm going to be defining a function now. Let's say I define a function foo, okay? And foo, what it does is, let's say I take an input x, okay? And then what I do is colon, and then let's say it returns, okay, x cubed, okay? So what this function does is I'm gonna take whatever the argument, input argument is, which is x, it's gonna spit out at the output of foo, it's gonna spit out x to the cube, right? x to the power of three. So if we go here to my, my, uh, my for loop, right? Suppose I want to use that. So what I would do is I would do foo, and then I would take in. And now if I run that, now what I get is zero. Oh, yeah, zero, zero, because zero to the third power is still zero. One is one, but then two to the third power is eight. 3 to the third power is 27, 4 to the third power is 64, and so on and so forth. It's a nice compact way. If you're going to use um, sort of a, a collection of code over and over and over again, it's a great way to kind of keep it clean, keep it compartmentalized, all right? So that's functions. And then the other way of doing nice compact ways of, of like kind of handling your code is something called the object. And the way we define object is in terms of classes, okay? This is probably the, the most confusing uh, thing. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna doodle on, on the, um, on the uh, like, you know, tablet here to kind of explain a little bit how this works, okay? So, so the way it works is the following. So, so suppose I have a class And it's called and and I call it foo two. Almost looks like a function, but what what it does is the way Python works. It's 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 like object it's like object oriented a little bit. So what it does is I can define a variable that essentially is kind of like like a whole bunch of different functions and data all contained with it. So the way the way Python does this is it does the following. You have class, very important, super important. Indent. All right, indent. It's one of those other quirks. In addition to for loops um, and functions, uh, when you define an object uh, through this class, uh, you also have to indent. And so what you'll need to do is a couple of things. 
first of all, you'll need to def underscore underscore init underscore underscore and then self name. So you might say, what the heck is that? So what this is, is the following. So what this does is this here, self, is the placeholder, okay, for whatever you ultimately, whatever object you define, okay? And name, okay, the name here is part of your instantiation of this instantiation. It's, shucks, I wish I knew how to spell this. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Boop. Instantiation. Okay, good enough. So what it does is several things. So first of all, this here is your initialization function. This here is a placeholder for the name of the object you're going to be defining using this class. And name here is the instantiation of the variable that is going that object's going to have. So if you have like, you know, if you're going to have like a um, bunch of data that's going to be associated with that object that you're going to define using this class, you'd be instantiating a bunch of that. Okay. But so so you'll see in the example, right? So let's suppose I have this function. So self, when you actually define an object, self would be replaced by the name of that object. And then dot, okay, that, that's the starting point saying, okay, what do I want to define? Like what, what, what is the variable I want to define or the information I want to define within that object? And that would be here, that would be name, name. And that's going to be equal to, that's going to be equal to name. Okay. Now, so this here, all of this is just to kickstart things. Like, you know, when, when you define that object, you're going to have to like define a whole bunch of initial parameters for that or initial data and, and all the variables that are associated with that object through the class. So then you can also assign to it different functions that can be operated in that object. Like, so let's say I want to change name. So what I would do is I would have a def and I would have something called change name. And then self. And then there would be new name. And then here, Oh yeah, forgot, bloop, 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 bloop. I would have here self name would equal new name. And you might say, okay, so what? So this is how it would work. So if I, so if I had this, right? What would, what would happen is, let's say I, I, I created something called, um, I don't know. Like um, like student. The way I would do it is I would say, all right, I'm going to create this object called student. It's going to be equal to. It's going to be equal to um, foo two, and then let's say Bob, in honor of my father. So what this has done is, remember self, that's self. Bob here, that's name, okay? And foo here, that's the class that, I'm, that I am basically making, I'm making student a class and it's being initialized, it's being instantiated with the name Bob to start with, okay? So if I do a printout, if I do print student 
dot name, it's going to spit out Paul. If at the same time I do, okay, uh, student dot change name, To Jill, what I've just done is I've replaced Bob with Jill in that variable. So if I now do print student dot name, it's going to produce Jill. So let's let's actually do this. But this is really important. This is like everywhere in Python, and you may or may not be using it a lot actively in the course, but there's a lot of code that has this. So you kind of need to, like when you look at the code and say, like, what the heck is underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, that's what it means, all right? So let's actually take a look. Like, let's actually do this in, in, in the environment. So one, two, three, four, nice and safe. Ah, ha, ha. So if we do that, let's, let's define it up here. And I'm going to just put that here. So what we would do is we would say class who to, okay? and then we would do def underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And we would say self name, right? And then again, colon and self uh, dot name would be equal to name. Okay, cool beans. And then we would also have def change name. Uh, Schneikies. What is it? Self. And then new name. Boop. And that would be equal to self dot name is equal to new name. And away we go. So now I've defined it at the top. If I go to the eighth example, and I do a call, like let's say I, I define something. So let's say student is equal to foo two and do Bob or foo. Yeah, no, <laughs> Bob. And then I do print student dot name and then I do student dot change name. So essentially I don't have to do a function call on student. I basically call this function call within student to do the name change for me because it's already been defined there. If I do that, let's run it. There, Bob and Jill. So you might be using classes and objects in your Python programming. The motivation for at least understanding this is because let's suppose that you found some code on the internet and you want to use it in your MQP or in 3.3.11 and such. And you want to go through it and at least understand it, at least syntax, syntax, um, syntactically, you'll sort of now understand if let's say there's a whole bunch of objects and classes defined there, you know the structure to kind of decode what the heck everything is doing. So that's that's really, really important. Okay. So that's objects and classes. So um, just going through my notes. So um, what we're going to do now is 
we're going to go through NumPy, okay, a little bit of SciPy and Matplotlib, okay. Um, then what we'll do is uh, do a quick example of like a, a creating a sinusoidal tone, right? Uh, in the frequency and time in frequency domains. And then take a quick look at Jupyter notebooks before we call it a night, right? So what, um, what NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib are, they're really powerful packages that you know, everyone's like saying, well, you won't get the same functionality like you do in MATLAB. Uh, no, you, you, you can't, right? So let, let's, let's start off with like NumPy, okay? So with NumPy, I mentioned that NumPy, like, you know, that, that lists in Python are not, not too compact. The way you would make a compact array or something is to use something called the NumPy array, um, which, also, there's a lot of functionality. If let's say you want to export a NumPy array, import a NumPy array, manipulate a NumPy array, there's a lot of functionality there. So what you do is like, for instance, if you want to create a NumPy array, you just literally use a NumPy array. Now, this is super important. So remember this NP, SP, PLT? This is where it pays off. So to call a NumPy array, you need to first of all say like, hey, you need to go to NumPy. So you would normally, if you didn't put a shorthand, you would have to do NumPy dot array, okay? And then define one, two, three. Right, and that would create a NumPy array that's a, it's a one-dimensional vector, one, two, three. But imagine having to write five letters over and over and over and over again. All right, so what you instead do is that shorthand, NP. Now you're cooking with gas because what that does is you just define NumPy array, right? And it's loading, it's trying to figure out what the heck array is, ah, see, success. And one, two, three. And if you print that, right? If you, if you let's say we assign that to AA, we print AA, one, two, three, okay? So no big deal. Right, it's just like hey, but this this is actually really powerful because there's a lot of functionality. It's more compact. Um, you might say, oh, big deal. It's not. It's like Python lists, NumPy arrays. But in terms of like numerical processing and functions that are out there that would help you in electrical and computer engineering applications, there's a lot more out there that supports NumPy arrays. Okay, so you have NumPy arrays. Right. And you can define them like this, or you can also do numpy arrays that are two-dimensional. Okay. And for that, yeah, you have to do, again, it's almost the same notation. Yep. Four four, five, six, and then close brackets. So am I, no, missing a square brackets. So now, and if you print that, now what you have is a two dimensional matrix, one row, one, two, three, second row, four, five, six. Okay. So, so that, that so another thing that you would find useful, and this comes up all the time in communications, is random number generation. That's that's a biggie. So if you want to create random integers, you want to create Gaussian random numbers or uniform random numbers. This is also really powerful stuff. So in this tenth example, 
what you would do is you would actually, first of all, the first thing you would need, so with anything with like random number generation uh, in a computer environment, you always have to call upon, you, 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 would, you would have to say, okay, how do I start making that random? It, it, they follow an algorithm, but they start off based on some sort of initial value, which is called a seed. So what you need to do is you need to, uh, first of all, generate a random seed. Otherwise, if you don't, a lot of times it'll just base it off of the computer clock. So you would do numpy dot random dot seed. And then you would say, for instance, zero, okay? And then what you would do is you would say, okay, um, I want to create a random integer. Cool, let's do that. So let's say we call it uh, R Alex. Such a cool name, Alex. <laughs> and then you do num numpy dot random dot rand int. So rand int is a random integer generator, right? And you could replace this with others, and I'll show you in a few minutes how you do that. So let's say we call it R int. So rint. And then we say, okay, um, let's say we create values between zero and 10. It could be any one of those values, right? Um, I could also make it a matrix or a vector. So let's say size is equal to six. And if I run it, and I do R int Alex, what happens? I create a random number generator. Like I create a vector of length six and these integers are chosen at random, right? I could also do this, let's say with R uniform, num p dot random dot in this case uh what is it uniform let's say, let's just say we just do, do one value uniform between let's say the values of zero and five and instead of an integer value this could potentially produce um, um uh, a floating value so now if we do a printf sorry print it would be r uniform Alex, and let's see what that produces. Oop. And that's what it produces. If I run it again, different value. Uh, is it? It's not. <laughs> so would we, yeah, oh yeah. So let's say we, am I defined? So maybe we have to call the system clock. Yeah, see, so. Ah, uh, yeah. So right now, what I need to do is I need to call the system clock here. So the way you would do that is you would do import sys, right? And then dupe, uh, let's say how you get time. So let's go to Stack Exchange and you say Python. random seed time. And so you would look on and uh, what would happen is, okay, no, you'd not use um, uh, sys, you would use, so you would use something like sys, uh, not sys, uh, date time, okay? And then you would import from there. So, sorry, you would say from, so it's a little bit different. So these really, really big packages. So not only do you have to say, okay, it's date time, but within those packages, you would have to call the specific module, right? So then you would, you would call date time from, from this huge package date time. And then what you would do is over here, random seed, you would do date time dot now. So if you do that, 
fingers crossed. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Cannot cast scalar do, 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 according to rule safe. Okay, silly. Uh, or you could do time time. Then we, we just have to do an import. So date time. So instead you do time. So what ends up happening is you do time and you would do time dot time. Okay, cool beans, run the thing. Ugh. Okay, fine, I give up. But, but you get the picture, you could, look, I would have to dig into what that error message is doing. But what happens is you could set any number that you want in seed. Like in this case, I use the seed value of zero in order to produce that, that, that value. But you, know, you might wanna choose something like a time or maybe some other sort of function that changes every time you run this, this code in order to create those random values. So you could also use something called Gauss, which would produce a Gaussian value as well. And you can specify the mean and the standard deviation. So now um, there, there are a few others before we jump into plotting, okay? So there's, um, there's something called uh, NP concatenate. So, so um, the way that works is the following. So NP concatenate is actually pretty powerful because what it will do is you can take two vectors or two matrices and you can connect them side by side on top of each other. You can make a line. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it, I, I suspect that MATLAB probably can do that as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's nearly the same, same as spiel. So in fact, let's try it out now. So look at the ninth example. We have AA and we have BB, right? We have a vector of length three, and then we have a matrix two, two by three. So let's stack them, right? So the way NP concatenate would work is you would take A, AA, you would take BB, and then you would also specify the axis. In this case, it would be one. And one, I think, see, this is, this is that little experimenting stuff. Uh, one should be the vertical axis. So if we do that, uh, maybe not. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, ha, ha. No, can't do that that way. So maybe it is zero. Huh, that's weird. So this is where exactly you would go into like something like Firefox. So this actually would be a great learning moment. And you would actually look at, so let's say you do a search and you would say NP dot concatenate, concatenate, and then uh, example. So you go to, so there would be numpy.org. Okay. And then you can go all the way at the bottom. And yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot brackets. So, and then, yeah, whether it's zero or one. So in this case, uh, we would need to do zero, axis zero. So minimize that. So what you need to do is do brackets, brackets, now we're in business. And then we would do print, print CC. And if we run it, One dimension. 
Uh, sigh. Let's try it again. Huh. Why is that happening? So if you go back to the example, so you have NP array, right? And you have NP array, and then you do the concatenation of the two, and then you choose axis. It should work. Hmm. This is very silly. See, what are those things? So if we, again, bring this up, what does it say? Trace back, da 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 So it's an error. Axis one is out of bounds for array of dimension one. So, so now, so yeah, so what you would need to, to, to kind of look into is, okay, um, something's not, well, actually, so maybe we, let's, let's first see if, if at all I'm, I'm even using this correctly. I so think you, the error message I have is telling me that I can't concatenate a one dimension array with a two dimension array. But yeah, no, but that, but the funny thing is, the example they give. <gasps> Ew! Thank you, thank you. That's that's spot on. So, but it seems like you have to you have to do like this double bracket thing in order to because I think maybe there's like some weirdness with respect to vector versus matrix. Yeah, yeah. So so let's let's see if we do. If we do con uh, concatenate and we don't define the axes, what, what is happening? So if we do that, so it should be concatenating A with itself and axes we specify as none. Yep. So yeah, 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 yeah. So now let's, let's do some fun stuff. This, I'm not sure if it's kosher, but um, let's put a second set of square brackets because, because here you have single and there you have double. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love Python. So what ends, what, what happens is I think you have to take the vector. You have to, by putting the double brackets, you now turn it into a matrix and therefore you can actually operate in two dimensions. Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Emma. So if you take um, a vector and then a matrix, it probably won't work, but if you make that vector now a matrix, but it's a matrix of one by N, and then you have uh, a vector M by N, then you're, now, you're, now you're cooking. So cool, awesome, thank you. So concatenate's really important. And then SciPy, I'm just going to bring up SciPy. There's a number of functions there. 12, 12, yep, example. Um, there's a number of good ones, but um, like SciPy in itself, like one of the, the big ones is, I'm going to bring it up, is going to be um, convolution. So there's there's one called there's one called um, convolve, right? So what you would do is let's redefine SciPy here, and we instead call we because it is big, right? So we'll do from SciPy import, and inside SciPy there's something called signal. And that is actually a really important module inside SciPy. And so what you would do is you would call, you would call like, you would call um, um, from signal, you would call um, convolve. So suppose we take, shucks, we take like A and convolve it with itself, right? So what you would do is you would say, um, 
let's say output one, and you would do signal dot convolve, convolve. And what you would do is you would say, let's say AA with itself, we convolve it with itself. And then what you do is you plot the output. Oh, sorry, print. Okay. Um, yeah, that's correct. So what you would do is if you do that, And, and this makes sense because if you take a vector and convolve it with itself, what happens? If the vector is of length three, the convolution should be double that minus one, which makes sense. So this is fine. The highest value should be um, like, it should, no, no, it shouldn't necessarily be at the center. But, but what would happen is at the end of the day, if you count it, um, that, that, that convolution, There is something a little bit off there. Let me, that's not. Yeah, because the one thing about convolution, no, no, is it? Because it's so, if it's like. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what ends up happening is you get this, this, this function as, you know, like you take the two vectors, whatever overlaps, you multiply, you sum them together, then you do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, and then you get this vector at the end of the day, right? So SciPy actually has a lot of other cool functionality in particular with respect to filtering. Uh, we won't go into too much detail here because we are running a little bit behind schedule, but, but the idea is if you go into filtering, um, there's like, there, like it's also in signal and there's, there's quite a few, but the biggie that, that I love is, is the following. So uh, there's something called, um, eighteenth example. So what you could do is there's something called scipy okay, dot signal dot l filter. Okay. And what this does is this filtering routine. Okay. You have the coefficients of the denominator, sorry, numerator, and the denominator and the input. And it works pretty much like, let, let's say if you have a Butterworth filter or something like that, what you would do is you would find out the coefficients of your filter. It could be FIR, it could be IIR. You have an input and then the output of that would like, once you have the filter coefficients would be the filtered signal um, given those coefficients. It's, and, and the thing is, is that they have a variety of different filter design tools in order to generate the A's and the B's. So like, for instance, if you go to the SciPy documentation, what they choose, like, let's say, for instance, they have something called Butterworth, right? So you like, let's get rid of SciPy. So all you really need is signal. So suppose I uh, define A and the B and A by signal, and this is my favorite name, Butter, <laughs> and then you define it as a third order, third order Butterworth filter. Okay. And what ends up happening, uh, you, you define A and B. Suppose you have as an input, I don't know, um, like you, or like a really long X, like, you know, value of X, what would happen is, uh, so let's think. So let's create a numpy array. Um, so let's let's go back up here, random seed. Now, nah. so let's actually like put in like a, a delta. So how you would do that? 
Uh, so we did, so let's find a NumPy array. Here we go. So what we would want is to use the function arrange. Okay. So let's say we create X. So I'm going to call it X, Y, Z. And where the heck is my note for that? Oh yeah, here we go. Arrange. And then here, what you would do is you would say, okay, arrange. No, I don't want arrange because that's going to be one, two, three, four, five. I want zeros. So my my suspicion is there's probably like numpy zeros. Yeah, there we go. So we want numpy zeros. And that thing is probably going to be, let's say we define 100 of them. Or, yeah, let's say 100 or 99. 99 lift balloons. And what now what we're going to do is we're going to do concatenate, right? We're going to concatenate this. Okay. Um, I haven't tried this before, so this is going to be kind of interesting. NP. Concatenate. And then we're going to put a one. We're going to have X, Y, Z. And that's it. And then let's say axis equals none. And then what happens is we have the Butterworth filter and da, 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 da. So let's first see if this works before we even plot anything. That's going to be my segue into, into um, Shakarino's, um, uh, like, you know, the map plotlet. Ah, ha, ha, didn't work. Uh, da, 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 concatenate got multiple. Ah, oh, silly me. Do, 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 do. You have to put round brackets. Otherwise, it doesn't understand. It no understand. So if we do that, uh, but at least it's somewhat intelligible, correct? Huh. There we go. So it's definitely doing something, right? So now let's plot this thing. So this is the segue into matplotlib. And matplotlib works almost exactly like, uh, whatchamacallit, like MATLAB. So PLT, that's my shorthand, remember, from the top. Right? PLT. And then what you do is you do PLT figure. What this says is, okay, create a blank figure. Bloop. Okay. Next, PLT plot. Ah, uh, plot. And now what's expecting? This guy is expecting to have an X and Y value. So X, we don't have an X value. Not yet. So what we would want to do is we would, we would want to plot what the output of signal.l filter is. So that's going to be A, B, C. So that's the output. Oh, now we need to plot, now we need like an X value. So the way to do that is you would use, again, something like a range. So you would say, okay, um, um, let's say, X val is equal to numpy dot a range. So a range is the numpy version of range. Okay. And you would say, okay, uh, it's going to be now we need to find out what the length, the length of ABC is. So there I think it's like, uh, what is it? Numpy length. 
and it's probably going to be. Mm. Size. You could use numby size. Yeah, you could use like, um, or you can just get, uh, um, you can actually find out here, ABC. So see, this is the same thing as classes and objects, size. So that information should be contained in there. So now you have XVAL. So now, fingers crossed, let's see if this works. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Attribute, matplotlib has no attribute figure. Oh, mm, that's not right. Uh, it might be a function. Silly me, what the heck? That's not right. So if you have that sample plots and matplotlib, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there's a lot of data science stuff, but let's let's go with let's call it. Yeah, so I think okay. So let's just get rid of this for now because there's the other way to do it is you can also do PLT. This is actually way more important anyway. So, okay, because there's been lots of instances when I've been doing it even where you, if you don't do show, it will not render the plot and then it's like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> so um, let's give this a try. That plot lib has no attribute plot. Okay, something really funny is happening here. So I'm going crazy. That plot lib is PLT. Yeah, so first of all, let me put that again back there. So, na, 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 na. has no attribute PLT. Very, very, very weird. Oh, do I have to do pi plot? Yeah. There we go. That should work better. Ha ha ha, success. So here folks, is what happens when you send a delta function through a third order Butterworth filter. That's what you get at the output. Um, that's basically a delta function at the origin plus 99 zeros following it. Delta, it's basically, you know, you're, you're essentially at, 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 like, you know, um, essentially creating an impulse response to the input. And then the output would be what the characteristic of the filter would be, right? If you wanted to go a little bit more crazy, what you could do is you can also do um, like, you know, if you want to put variables, like that's the thing, like just from the basics, like there's X label. So you can say uh, time, oops. Uh, and then Y label. you can put uh, uh, amplitude. So if you do that, now you have X and Y labels as well, right? And you can do other things as well. Like you can actually do things like grid. Would you like a grid on this? So you can do like PLT grid, and then you can say, I, no, no, no. 
behave there. Grid, and you can give the Boolean true and it'll actually produce a grid for you. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things that you can do as well. You can plot multiple lines, you can put a legend, you can do things like that, right? So, so far what I've shown is all this really cool stuff. There's also things like, for instance, if I wanted to cr create like a sinusoid, right? What I could do is I could say x cos, right? Or let's say um, yeah, well, how about y cos? Y cos. And you can do numpy dot cos. And you could you can define here. Uh, first of all, you're gonna need to have a, a time domain uh, representation. So let's say you have t and this is actually going to be very important uh suppose you want uh fractional values not just integer values spread across a time index right so not just one second two second three second four but you it, you can't use a range so what you do is you use something called lin space and what you do is with lin space uh let me see my notes here. Um, oh, yes. So, lin space, what you do is you specify, let's say, from zero, zero dot zero, right, to let's say 100, no, 10, let's 10 dot zero. So, by making a decimal, you, you're right, right off the bat saying this is a float. And let's say the number of points that you want, num, is equal to 100. So what's going to do is lin space is going to create from zero to a hundred, I'm uh, sorry, zero to ten. It's going to create a hundred values evenly spaced. Beep 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 beep. Okay, and they're all going to be fractional. So let's say that's equal to t. Okay, so now what you do is all right, and then I have f, and let's say f is twenty. Okay, cool beans. So what you do is you would say okay, numpy cos is going to be uh, what's pi? Oh, it's in math. Uh, do I need to use? Yeah. Yeah. So you could use math. So you do import math. Yeah. And then what you do is you go down here. Okay, come on, silly. I bet you SciPy probably has it too. Uh, two times math.pi and then times what? Times F times T. Oh, point zero. Okay, so you now got that. And so now let's plot that. Oh, and let's make that capital T. So now we do all of that. Oop. And now what we do is we have, out, okay. So now we have um, T and we have Y out. And now let's give it a try. So first of all, we'll have the Butterworth. Okay, cool. And that's your cosine, right? And so if you want to also look at it from like a frequency perspective, what you could do is you can actually do the following. So what you do is um, you would take the y out and you would have to call, um, and I think the thing you would call is 
um, here we go, numpy. So you would call, so the output, let's say it's capital Y out, because uh, Python's case sensitive. Uh, you do numpy dot FFT, FFT dot FFT. I know it's very awkward. Uh, and then you would do is you'd say, okay, Y out. Now, very importantly, the way FFTs work is uh, you'd specify how many points you want that FFT to be. So if you don't define anything, it's going to assume that whatever the length of Y out is, it's going to produce an output FFT that's going to be the same length. We want something a lot higher resolution. So the way you would do it is we know that Y out is 100, right? We specified it in lin space. Uh, what we would want is something of resolution 1024. So what you do is you would say 1024, okay? And, and then there's a bunch of other things like, like axes and stuff. Like, let's, let's leave that out for now. And that might be dangerous. Then what you would need to do is you need to take the magnitude of that FFT because it's going to be complex value. So you would say absolute value, absolute uh, of out. What you would use is you would use numpy.abs of y out. And now with that, let's plot it. Uh, shakarinos, how do we do that? Here we go. Boop. So first of all, what you would do is you would use a range. And you would choose the, the uh, you know, the size of this thing. Okay. Then you would plot f as the x value and you would have abs y out and the x label would be frequency not really you know, we have to be careful about that but for now since i'm being a little bit sloppy you would have frequency and you would have not amplitude in the frequency domain magnitude okay and so now if we do this, and fingers crossed it works. OK, that's the output of our Butterworth loop. That's our sinusoid, sinusoid in time domain. And bloop, ah, hallelujah. That, folks, is our frequency domain representation of the sinusoid. So we could also crank this up a little bit. And also, let's say not 1024, let's say we want to take a 4096 FFT. What happens is the greater the size of the FFT, the higher the resolution you'll have. Like, you know, it'll be harder to see things, but you're going to have a lot more FFT points. And what happens is you might wonder, well, it's only a 100, 100 sample time domain vector. Sure. But whenever you have, let's say, an FFT, size that's much larger than that of the input, what happens is the FFT is going to zero pad. So if you have that, what's going to happen is it's just going to, it's, you're going to see in a second, bloop, bloop, and bloop. And this, let's say if we enlarge it, really high resolution. Yeah, perfect. Right, so that that's how you do finding the uh, the uh, frequency response, the magnitude frequency response using Python. Okay, so last but not least, all right, this is all cool and stuff, but if you're taking like something like thirty three eleven, one of the requirements is that you need to submit stuff in something called a Jupyter notebook, and what a Jupyter notebook is is you notice how I just run this script and it's like block, 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 block. And then it's just a bunch of stuff spit out the terminal. Not very graceful. So this is how you do it in Jupyter Notebook. 
So first of all, what you do is you would say new file. You would save new file. And I would call it submission.ipynv. So that's the extension for a Jupyter Notebook. So if you do that, what happens is Python now is like saying, OK, I got this. I know what this is. So I hope so. It looks like it's still thinking. Ah, that's horrible. So what happens is the way Jupyter Notebooks work is it's, it's kind of funny, but basically it's running its own web server local on, locally on your computer within that environment. And it's setting it up in such a way that um, essentially it's like a web page that will change dynamically based on like the output of the py Python snippets in each part of the Jupyter Notebook. Hmm, this is really silly. Okay. So no, I don't want Python. So why is this not IPYNB? Yeah, that's correct. Let's try it again. Otherwise, I'm just going to go completely crazy. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So what happens is the way this works is it effectively runs it like a web server. So the way, so what you do is, let's say, you can do some really cool stuff. So for instance, here, um, forgot how the feature, so not deep. So you can debug within the cell. There are also ways of formatting, right? That's really cool, but I'm not gonna bother with that right now, but the way it would work is, let's say I want to compartmentalize every, every little bit and piece, right? So what I would do is I would say, let's say I put all the importing stuff in one cell in my Jupyter Notebook. Ooh. Okay. And then now let me create a new cell. Um, Chakarinos. Yeah, there we go. You just click code. And let's say I define a function. I define my class. And now let's say I begin putting examples. So what, what it effectively does is it compartmentalizes everything. And what's really cool is the following. So let's say I save this. And I begin running it. So I can run the first thing. So I can literally run snippet after snippet after snippet after snippet after snippet, right? So run. Okay. And I have to choose which Python environment. That seems safe. Okay, cool. Oh, silly. Um, install. There we go. That's what I like about VS Code. If you don't have it, it's going to install for you. I just like this. I'm just going to sit back and watch this paint dry. <sighs> so it's going to do all that cool stuff. It's going to hopefully not explode on me. Oh, there is something called Jedi there. I did not know that. Okay, cool beans. So now it's going to go back to the kernel and it's going to execute all this stuff. All right. So in 1.7 seconds, it executed this. Okay, big deal. Next. All right, 0.5 seconds. Bloop, 0.3 seconds. This is the first one that actually has something to say, right? Uh, like it actually acts in the output, bloop, and it spits it out here. And you might say, okay, again, big deal. Check this out. Let's say here's the second example. Okay. What happens is it, it kind of nicely associates outputs directly to the snippet of code, you know, it, in line 
And what happens is I could run everything. I can do run all, and it's just going to generate everything. And it's it's a lot more human readable than just like, here's a script and it just produces a bunch of stuff. So if we fast forward now to the plots, right? Now let's look at the plots. Um, let's just make sure I don't have anything here. Print A, B, perfect. Let's let's fast forward and take that. Doop. Okay. Let's add a plot. Okay. Nope. And then this. Save it. And now run all. What the Jupyter Notebook will do is actually embed that plot into your Jupyter Notebook output. It's really a nice, graceful way of containing everything and presenting it. That's why in 3311, there's no, there are no PDFs of reports. It's essentially just give us a Jupyter Notebook Make sure everything's documented right, and we'll take it from there. All right. So, any any questions? We're a little bit over time, so I, I do want I do want to be mindful of like if you have any other appointments after this, like <clears throat> like sleep. <laughs> but um, any questions from anybody before we call it a night? Also, I think my dog probably needs to go out for a walk, but. Like, I think you can, you can wait a little bit, like a few more minutes. But so any other questions? Ah, yes, there is a question. Do, 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 do. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Professor Wiglinski. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nichols. So with that, um, I think we're going to call it a night. Um, and, and again, if you're in 3311, this should be, I'm going to check right now um, that it gets linked to our Canvas page. But uh, from there, um, like, you know, if, if there's something that you saw that you missed that you want to re watch again, it's, it should be up there. All right. So with that, uh, everybody have a great evening um, or night at this point. And uh, I'll see you all in class tomorrow. So have a good night.